What up, Sleeds? Back to back days. Welcome. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Here. Today, special guest, Gustavo Guerrera, fellow entrepreneur in this music game. A man of many traits like myself. There's a lot of us out there in this in this music biz. Just type it in here. Guerra, right? Yeah, okay. Got that. Let's make sure I'm not spelling that right. Gustavo Guerra, pinned to the top. All right. We should be here any second. Shout out everybody rolling in. DGTL Beats, Power TD5, Justin David 48, In Ones 1, Phase 973, Is Your Boy, The East Coast Store. Shout out. Our, oh yeah, Rest in Peace, Gift the Gab, Black Delicious. It's unfortunate. He was, you know, he was struggling for a while with kidney failure and it's, uh, I saw him perform under that with that condition and I mean he really was hanging in there man and he really gave it a good fight but I'm sure he's in a better place now no more ailments so rest in peace gift to gab shout out Black Alicious the whole team great shows great performer but feel free to shoot out any messages until we wait for Mr. Guerra CEO of the Producer Plug. I don't know if you've seen those showcases that we've been doing. There, the Producer Plug showcases we've been promoting, where they have DJs from all over competing and big guest judges. He runs this, so that's who's here. Oh, Justin Gordon in the building. Shout out, Justin. In the building, absolutely. I am like local hip hop. What up? We just chilling. Eastside Sheesh in the building. Catch him perform with Rome Streets, August 17th. SD Knack, shout out Evil Doer. Coach Bombay. Not Mighty Ducks, but. Oh, East Coast Store says Justin's a living legend. Yukon is in the building. Funny, you kind of just got a text from Justin Clancy while you things sent that. <laughs> <coughs> Not Justin Gordon, Justin Clancy. <laughs> the Teb the God is in the building. We got all the legends in there today. Friday afternoon, everyone cutting out early. Is that what's going on? Excuse me, I have an itch on my nose. No shame. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that, Yukon, but, you know, I it's funny. <laughs> Damn, this nose, man. Ain't easy having a nose this big. Phase 9973 is laughing. Uh-oh, Ateb's dropping his girl. I'm not going to bother to sing that. <laughs> in the Latab voice. Uh oh, producer plug is entered the building. It, yo, Gustavo, is that the one where you yeah, okay, here we go. He's running off that. Alright, we got we're going live right now. Gustavo. Uh, How we doing, brother? Doing good, man. Doing good. Cool, cool. You hear me all right? Doing this hey, sound perfect. check. Nah, are you perfect? Everything's good. Everything's gracious. Take All right, that's what's, that's what's up. Getting a little bit of a glare here. Hold on one second here. Uh, Give me one second. I don't know where it's coming from. Whoa. Make sure to put make, the glares off, man. I got the glare off. So I want to welcome everybody to the Leeds Entertainment Podcast. Uh, this is with special guest this week, Gustavo Guerra of the Producer Plug, you and I, among many other talents. <laughs> Me and you go back, bro. Yeah, I was trying to think, you know, I was thinking about how far we go back. I'm thinking the first time I remember doing business with you is we booked Large Professor in Boston. Is that, is that correct? 
Yeah, it was large, and then we did Trage right after. I had a DJ for Trage um, one night. We did a show up there, and that was, we, I had mad fun, man. I think that was one of the best DJ sets I have ever done for Trage. The energy was there. Boston was there. The whole mass was there. So it, it was just always good energy. You got, you know, you always make sure, you know, you're taken care of when we get over there. So, yeah, it, it's nice, man. You know what I mean? And you always like the one thing I can say about you, you are always artist friendly. You always make sure the artist managers, everyone is happy and stuff, you know, and you make it happen, man. You, you definitely rep Boston, the whole mass, you know what I mean? So all you guys, man, like you want to get your shows up, you want to get your promo up, holla at Leeds, man. He, he knows, he knows that they're, the target demographic that you got. I'm not saying it because I'm on I use myself for my marketing plans. I call him, I pay him, not no free shit. We need to get out of that free free state of mind shit, man. You guys, guys got to be supporting guys like Leeds and myself, man, to support other people as well. You know? Well, thank you, man. I, uh, I didn't ask you to say all that. If anyone's asking, I did not pay him to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you, man. Um, I really, uh, I really appreciate that. That though, that's cool. And uh, you know, I, it's tough business, man. We got we got to treat each other fairly. You know what I mean? If we're not treating each other fairly, then we're gonna all be struggling. And Especially we don't need to struggle the anymore. COVID you know? thing, man. I think that should that should wake a lot of people up, man. Just to help each other out. You know, that's that's the main thing. A lot of businesses, a lot of people. You know, lost lost family members. You know, God bless to them. People lost their businesses. You know, and people are now trying to rebuild. So, you know, the best thing I can really tell everyone is like, yo, even even if you give someone like, hey, I don't got a budget, but I can give you something, I can work with people, man, because people are going tough times right now. You know, absolutely. Well, hopefully, we're coming out on the other end of it, starting to turn a corner. But I want yeah. to take people back. I, I like when I do this, I go, uh, you know. Get a little history on you. I mean, you are a New Yorker, born and raised. Is that what? Born it is? and raised in New York, yeah. And you, your aunt's, your heritage. You're Spanish. Is that what it is? Yeah. Um. My my parent my parents are Ecuadorian and Colombian. You know, and then like my my great my great grandmother, um, she's um, she's from um Brazil and and Ghana, you know, and then from my um. And then from my, my, my grandmother's side, they're like Ecuadorian, Italian, Mexican, French. It's just weird. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So, yeah, it's just, it's, just, it's just a gumball of stuff. You know what I mean? Where, where are you right now? Because that doesn't look like New York in the background. Man, man I'm, on, I'm on a Father's Day vacation. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm in Mexico right now. You know what I'm saying? Ah. You know what I mean? I'm in Tulum. I just went to the pyramids. Uh, a few days ago, you know, and uh, I just, you know, I, I have an eight-year-old son. His birthday is next month. He turns eight. And uh, I write, I, you know, for me, uh, my father always told me that um, teach your kids your history, your heritage, you know, where, where, where they come from. So when we came out here, I said, yo, let's go to the pyramids. Let's go to the Mayan ruins. And basically, you know, that's part, that's part of our legacy. That's part of who we are. You know, one of the first people to have pyramids, to have civilizations, to have, you know, um, hospitals, their forms of hospitals and farming and agriculture and all that. So it was, it was, it, it, it was, it was great just to be, be there and spiritually feel like the ancestors with you, you know? And, and it, it is, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. You know what I'm saying? Cause you know, these, these, these schools ain't going to teach teach my son knowledge yourself, so I, I got to do it myself, you know what I mean? Even if it's on my Father's Day vacation, that's what you're supposed to do, you know? Being a father doesn't mean, I always tell this everyone, being a father doesn't mean you have to give your kid money all the time and you're not there. Being a father is going to a baseball game, helping them with, with, with homework, you know what I mean? The little things, you know what I mean? Listening to them, picking them up from school, you know? And they don't need to be all the time, but just, just do it, man, and, and it goes a long way, you know? Yeah. Speaking of that, I just got my uh, good dad gang <laughs> terminology, gangstar. Yeah, also, congratulations to you on your anniversary, man. That's 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 big, man. You know what I'm yeah. saying? A lot of people don't understand, like, being married and being in a solid relationship, man. It gives you a lot of peace of mind. And, you know what I mean? Congratulations on that, too, brother. You know what I mean? Thank you. You know, 
so let's uh, let's go back to the music real quick. Um, how did you get involved? How did you get involved in the, in, in the music scene? I um so basically in high school, uh, my friend, you know, uh, he lived in one of the first kind of like luxury buildings in Long Island City called City Life, and uh, his mom his mom bought him some turntables. You know what I mean? But he never used them shits. So I was like, damn, he, my friend got mad money. You know what I mean? Not even going to use the technique. So I had records already. So I would go to his house and I would practice myself. Eventually, I was like, yo, man, I want to I wanna start doing mixtapes. So I started making mixtapes on my own. I got studio time, paid for myself, told my, told my boys to come with me. Like, yo, come. You know, we're going you know, to enjoy the studio shit. And um, I went to go get freestyles from guys like Ali Vegas, Bars and Hooks, um, Tragedy, uh, Killer Shaw, Rest in Peace, Foul Monday, like all these Queensbridge dudes. And um, I stopped blowing up on the mixtape scene. And um, what ended up happening is uh, I reached out to some guy named Emo Heli Rice. He was the, um, the talent guy for BET Rap City The Basement. And uh, I would give him my mixtape every Friday. So if you guys don't know, I'm just refreshed. Like every Friday, you can go to the, any, any record label and they'll give you records for free. But you have to show them your mixtape. If you're a club DJ or you're a radio DJ, they'll mail it to you or you can go pick it up. And sometimes they give you white labels. So That's like, a, That was the, uh, the record pools, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. so... Um, so I would go to I'll go to all the labels they'll give me they'll give me stuff. So every every Friday I'll go to BET and I'll just like harass this dude like yo I need to be on, you know Rap City the Basement as a guest DJ like I'm I'm hot in the street right now. So I did this mixtape with Big Mike right, and the reason why Big Mike reached out to me is because um I had I was one of the only few DJs in New York to have exclusive Fifty Cent records you know G Unit records, so. I was really like to this day, like my brother Sean Money, you know, Coach PR. I will go. I will go to Jamaica to pick up these exclusives. And fifty, I would get these drops from Fifty Cent very early on, before anyone else. So Big Mike was like, "Yo, how can I, you know, how can we do a tape?" And I was like, "Let's do a tape together." I got like four exclusive Fifty joints. You know what I mean? Um, and this tape was called Crew Summer. And once I did this tape with him, it, it, it took off. Like uh, when, that, when like this is this is pre social media. So how I knew the tape took off it was is that we started in 125th Street in a spot called Burkinas in that area. We put our mixtapes there, and by the time we got to Canal Street, right, it was already bootleg. So when we got to <laughs> and it was like four hours, it was that quick. When we got to Canal Street and it was already bootleg, that already showed like. The, the tape was hot. The tape was on fire. So every borough had that, my, my tape bootleg. So I brought the tape to Emo Haley Rice, and I was like, yo, what's up? Like, and he's like, yo, he, showed, he, he basically came downstairs and brought my tape, my CD. He's like, this is you? I'm like, I told you I'm, I'm, I'm scorching in these streets. You got to let me in. So he was like, yo, all right. I still call on this phone maybe two weeks down the line, and I fell asleep one day, like I had a nap, and, and um, I had a, a vivid dream that I was DJing at Rap City The Basement, and this, then, the third, and then when I woke up from the dream, there was a voicemail from Emo Haley Rice telling me, hey, next Friday, you're going to be on Rap City The Basement uh, at this time. These are the records. Check your email for the records you have to bring. And uh, after I did that, man, like, like I took off, you know what I mean? And... Uh, and around what that was your what was your DJ name at the time? DJ Phantom. Phantom, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then around that time as well, I started to, uh, you know, I started to learn distribution. Um, my boy D Life, you know, Tropical Quest DJ, Ashanti's DJ. After I did that tape with Big Mike, he reached out to me through Big Mike and was like, "Yo, I want I want to do some tapes with you. Like, I'm on tour with Ashanti for a first album. I I need I need to have you know like." Ashanti out in these tapes, so me and him started doing these tapes called The Wire from from the show. So we did like we did like three tapes. We had like 
I had 50. This and it was weird because I had 50 and I had Jaru shit. And no one is saying it neutral. I'm like, yeah, man, just putting out the music. Like I don't got no beat for no one. So them tapes blew up big, but the one thing he told me was distribution. He was telling me, like, yo, you don't need to go to Canal Street and all these stores to sell mixtapes for three, four dollars. You can go to this one spot, make it into a jewel case. You could sell it for nine dollars. You don't need to be doing all the running around. When I learned that, it, it was like, come on. It was like, oh shit, I just gotta make my shit look official, put a shrink wrap on it, and I can sell it to this guy. His name was Mitch. Um, I think it was like Top Line or Red Line or something like that. That's the name. Of, I think it was Top Line, uh, Top Line Distribution in Queens. And man, I did that tape. I made four thousand in two days. The most I've ever made in a mixtape ever in my life. And uh, after I learned that, man, it, like I was just, just doing personalized mixtapes for people. So I did one for Bars and Hooks. I did one for Traj. I did one for Killer Sha. Um, uh, man, it was just I did one for Ashanti. And and then um, and then from there, like this guy named Chris Landry, he reached out to me and he was like, "Yo, we want I want to bring my I want you to work for some company called Sure Shot. We was land speed at one time, but we got." You know, we got shut down, so I'm starting my own label. So when that happened, you know, I kind of told him, like, yo, you know, I'm making good money in these streets. But he basically told me, like, look, that's cool, but I'm going to teach you the real distribution now, you know? And um, after that, I said, cool. I, like, you know, swallowed my pride. I'm like, all right, teach me this corporate shit. And then from there, I put out Saigon's first album called Warning Shots. I was signing in. I signed him. I did Consequence and Kanye West taking to the cleaners. I did um, um, Back Like Cook Rack Part One Two um, on 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 CD, like an actual CD. I did um, 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 Nori, What's Up to the Hood, uh, Trash, Thug Matrix, uh, oh, Rest in Peace, ODB. I did the Osiris Project, and that project alone was like man, like that project was so crazy because. No one was really rocking with ODB and Rockefeller like that. And out of respect of ODB and me being in, me working at the time at Def Jam for, for DMX label Bloodline, I was like, yeah, that's crazy. Like, why, why y'all not showing no love to ODB? So I was like, yo, I reached out to um, Big Face Gary. He was an A&R at the time at Rockefeller. Like, yo, let me incubate an ODB project. So I can get him back hot again. You guys, you Rockefeller don't need to worry about it. I just need Dane to sign off for me. And we'll do the incubation process. We'll get ODB hot again. And then you guys can take it to the next level. You know what I mean? And you guys do what you do. So um, I, I put a lot of that project together. And then, you know, he passed away. And um, and so he never got a, he never, I never, I, and the crazy part, I never met him. I got all the music done, but I never met him. Um, big shout out to Royal Flush. Um, how, how I ended up finding out about these vocals was uh, my, my good brother, Ben Grimm from Now and Later's, he was engineering one night for Royal Flush at the at the studio called Hitless in Queens. And um, he was like, yo, you can't believe he was in the studio with me right now. I'm like, are you in the studio with Flush? He was like, nah, I'm in the studio with Flush, Myra Carey, and Old Dirty Bastard. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. He was like, yo, bro, like, pull up. But I was I was already in another session. So I was like, man, maybe the next go around. And Flush is riding ODB rhymes. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, say this. And they're going back and forth and shit. So they're telling me the story. So when I when I when I start finding out about this whole ODB thing, um, I'm working on a project. I just hit Flush up. I was like, yo, Flush, I need some of these records you got with ODB. I can cash you out and we can get some stuff going. So after that project, that was the last project I did on Shore Shop. Uh, and I started my own distribution company, my own label called Moneymaker. And then I did my first, uh, my first solo release um, was uh, Method Man Presents Street Life, Street Education. And uh, we, we basically hit like top 20 in the independent charts. First time ever I've done this by myself. We had no big marketing. We had no music video. We had no radio, but we charted. And uh, and then from there on, me and Street Life were like inseparable. You know what I mean? So that, that's some of the some of the credentials, you know what I mean? 
I mean, the beginning credential of my, of, of my career, you know? Yeah, it's pretty impressive, man. You know, in the mixtape era, we're kind of from both those eras. I mean, I didn't work with the same caliber artist that you did, um, but I did. I started out doing mixtapes for artists and more of on an underground tip, <clears throat> but a really underground tip. But yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. You're a little, you're like a little in and out on me a little bit. Are you have good reception? Yeah, you, you hear me better now? Hold yeah, on. sometimes you like cut out like when you're talking. Hold on a second. You hear me better now? Yeah. All right. But yeah, I mean, I loved mixtapes was my, my first passion when it came to music, man. I love putting together mixtapes, whatever it was, you know, from a kid to, you know, then taking it professionally and, you know, that, that was my that was my favorite thing. That was my first introduction to the music business too, and uh, you know pressing them up on CDs and trying to get them in spots. And it was tougher for me to get them in spots because people would look at me like, who, who is this guy? Who's this white kid? Yeah. <laughs> but it was it like, was weird but, though. But yo, those CDs were dope. I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> I front like hustling mixtapes. It's like it was it it was a challenge for me. You know what I'm saying? It was a challenge because when I went to Harlem, they see this see this kid trying to sell a mixtape. They're like, man, yeah. no one's buying a tape, kid. I was like, yo, I'm gonna come back next week with a better tape. And I remember um, there was this one spot on uh, 125th in St. Nick. This dude moved mad tapes. So I always went to see him. And I just got this brand new 50 Cent record. It was 50 Cent and then um, Smith & Wesson, right? No one didn't have this, this track. So I went to him first. I went to him first because I knew he was going to buy at least 50 tapes from me off rip. So I was like, yo, this is my new tape. I had Ron Browse as my instrumental uh, um, producer. Like he, he had like, he, he gave me Nas Ether around that time. Um, he gave me, um, I think he gave me, uh, he gave me Nas Ether. He gave me um, Big LA Bonics. He gave me Cash the Dice Game. So I had like an instrumental thing. I gave it to Homeboy, and he was like, I never heard this 50 Cent record before. He said, let me get let, let me get 100 tapes right now. And I had like 100 on me. I gave him the whole, I gave him my whole bag, like, yo, hey. And after that, after that, I went to go see him. But it was like, the one thing I kind of like, you know, I want to tell like a lot of like the young people or that are going to be watching this as well. It's like, yo, man, don't get discouraged, man. I think a lot of the young artists get very discouraged, like, they need a cosign. I don't need that man's cosign. I just need to put out good material and eventually people come around. You know what I'm saying? I feel like when you feel like, oh, like, oh, fuck that person. It's like, nah, man, like that person's there for a reason. And if you can get to that caliber, they're going to respect you. But you got to be there, you know, being there humble, not there like trying to like huff and puff like you the shit. You know what I mean? But yeah, uh, but yeah man, like that, that, that gave me a lot of like, tough skin the mixtapes you know what i'm saying like you saying like they're looking at you lee's like man who the fuck is this dude trying to sell this <laughs> well my covers no? my covers were funny because i would use movie like movie movie posters and movie movie images yeah and then like i was doing my own graphic design i didn't really know what the heck i was doing so like mine mine didn't even really look like a mixtape like your traditional mixtape where you'd have like all the artists that were on it all in the front and stuff like that mine was like what the hell is this <laughs> But if you listen to it, you were like, ooh, this is fire. But it was like, I was, I was, I went the more underground, like, you know, sound bomb and sandbox, hip hop site, underground hip hop, whatever was on there type of stuff. Not more like New York street shit, but you know, there occasionally I would play New York street joint. I would have mixtapes that were like that, but I was very themed orientated. I had movie samples in between each joints. Uh, it's just kind of how I rolled at the time, <laughs> but, uh, but it was it was too hard. I was in New Hampshire, so it was like I didn't have the spots you had. It was some barber shops in Haverhill, but it wasn't like it, it was just a passion thing. You you made a living out of it, and congrats to that. I know a few people that made a living doing it. Tell me, how did it end for you, actually? Because I know like some people got in trouble and whatnot. <laughs> one thing, man. That's why I always say Chris Landry. He's the one that kind of was like, "Yo, fuck that street shit." learn the corporate shit, you right. know? And that kind of like, that saved me because I just went corporate. I just went like, look, 
versus you guys putting it out on the street, what I can do is I can put it out on a real CD. We can clear the samples, right? We can do a marketing plan and we make way more money. And I, I show them my past projects I've done. So like, damn, you said 10,000 independent. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You're making good money, you know? So you went from like, you went from mixtapes that had, you know, other people's music to making basically exclusive kind of albums in mixtape form. Is that yeah. fair enough to say? Yeah. 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 So that's, that's the transition. Because then at that point, you're not putting out copywritten music. There's not like leaking and piracy issues at that point. Everything's loud, correct? I always was a step ahead of everyone in the technology game as well. So it was like when I figured out distribution, right, and I figured out how this stuff works, uh, this guy came into the office one day from this company called iTunes, and they were talking about doing digital distribution and how digital distribution was going to be the new form of distribution. There's gonna be co-op costs, and co-op means is you pay $2 to put your CD in a store. There's no return reserve, which means that they take 25% of your money and they hold it because if they get returns, they have to put yeah. that back in. There is no distribution fee, right? A high distribution fee. So let's say like, if you sell a CD for $20, 50% of your money is already gone towards fees, co-op, return reserve. So you're not really making a whole dollar at the end of the day. Yeah. But with digital, you're only paying iTunes 30%, 20%. And the, and, and, and the label, if you sign the label, unless you have a, a direct deal. And uh, I told them, like, this, this is worldwide. So they don't have to worry about getting a CD sent to them. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, on the pulse and uh i remember uh i went to large professor and i was like yo man like we need to we need to start putting these projects out on uh, on digital on a digital format and then he was like digital man it sounded like some pyramid scheme shit. And I was like, man, man, like, trust me you put this online and i was like yo look sign this contract right give me give me 90 days give me a whole quarter to show you, right? My statement came in, he got that check. Me and him, me and him like became best of friends after that because he was like, damn, you, you, you know about this. <laughs> you, know about, you know about websites and things of that nature. So that's, I was always kind of a step ahead with you know, being like a nerd geek on, on technology. You know what I mean? Like learning like, the beginnings of social media, you know, learning these things. And I didn't go to no school for none of this. I just did it myself. Like I self taught myself, you know, um, and, and, and just and trial and error and seeing what really works and what don't work, you know. And uh, like you said, like, like, you know, and like fast forwarding as right now, you know, doing producer plug during the pandemic, you know, I had a virtual platform and I reached everyone all around the world. It wasn't just me doing beat battles in, in, uh, in New York in the tri-state area, I'm now, you know, because of the pandemic, I reached China, Italy, Japan, London, Ukraine, Czech Republic, like all around the world, India, like it, it was crazy. The first beat battle I did um, in, 2000, in 2020 in May, you know, with Mike Dean, it was, it was surreal, you know? Yeah, I want, I, want to, I want to just stop you real quick and just talk about the producer plug because for people that don't know what exactly it is, how exactly does it work and, you know, how did it all start and all that? Let's just talk about it from, the origin, from its original so, form. So basically what ended up happening is, uh, you know, I mentor a lot of up-and-coming producers. I just give them a game. I, I link them with lawyers and something ever goes wrong, they hit me up and then I'll go, you know, handle it. Like, yo, don't do that. That's the homie. That's bad business, you know what I'm saying? Um, eventually, it started to get starting to become annoying that these, these A&Rs, these executives, you know, they stealing kids publishing, stealing kids shit. Like, when I'm in stealing, like, yo, you want to be on this record, right? You got to give me, like, 10% of your publishing. And it's like, damn, like, how are you going to eat, you know? So... I was like, yo, why don't I just make a producer platform where I can get the architects of the hip hop game 
be the judges and I'll judge with them. And we just have these young up and coming producers come in and they play their beats. And A, they will learn how to be prepared to have these meetings. So I would tell them I need five to 10 beats, you know, um, no, like, no, no, no um, watermarks in it, five to 10 beats. The first two rounds are 45 seconds. If you make it to the finals, it's a minute each. And you have to play two tracks. And uh, the first one I had Large Professor, Ron Browse, Ben Grimm from the Noun Laters, Red Spider, DJ J Love. And uh, it, was, it was big. You know, a lot of people came out, it was in Brooklyn. And a lot of people started to pull up to that. And then uh, I did a second one. I did it with um, 45 King, Easy LP. And, uh, and it was big. A lot of people came out. And then the third one I did um, was um, in, 20, in 2020, in the top of 2020, was, uh, was uh, Havoc, 45 King, and Rock Wilder. And, the, and just, it blew up. Like, there's so many people that came. And in February of 2020, I had a uh, Ghostface Killer as, as a judge. And more people started to act about it. And then the pandemic hit. And... Uh, all the producers now are saying like, damn, we're all cool with each other. We're all networking. We're all getting placements. We're all working with each other. But what are we going to do? We have all these beats. I remember that in 2013, this is why I always talk about being a step ahead in technology. In 2013, I started to work with a guy named Steve Gobbley. You guys know the guy who signed Pitbull, Shakira, Ying Yang Twins, Little John, Mike Geronimo, Irv Gotti, uh, DMX, Jay-Z, uh, Nine Inch Nails. He's like a legend, right? Like an uh, industry legend, right? He basically, my friend David Park, he owns this company called Prefix Mag. And he said, yo, you should sit down with Steve. He has this thing called Shindig. It's a virtual um, concert platform. And so very early on 2013, I started doing stuff with Young Chop, SD from Chicago, um, because they had big, um, a big audience. And at the same time, I was working for this virtual company, virtual theme park, um, theme party company called Boiler Room. So I was already in tune to like doing these virtual shows. And I knew that it will get to a, a wider fan base online. So all my producer plug guys are hitting me up like, yo, what are we gonna do? We do producer plug again. And so I hit Steve up. I'm like, yo, I'm gonna do this thing with Mike Dean. Can I use your platform? I'll give you a percent of, of what I make. Um, and he said, yeah, let's do it. And then once we did it, it just, it just blew up from there. And uh, from there, we had Mike Dean. He was the judge. We had, um, we had Mike Dean. We had, uh, um, was, um, we just had Robert Glasper, um, Brian Michael Cox, uh, Man, we just we just we just had so, so well. You much. actually you actually brought in some originators. You brought in Bob James. Bob James, yeah. I just had Bob. So you brought in like you brought in like original composers. Even this wasn't just like hip hop producers. This was like you know original players too. You know what I mean? Bob James, man. I knew Bob James um, for almost eight years. How I met Bob James was through RZA. I met RZA. Uh, I mean, I always knew RZA because we was because of the whole, the whole Wu-Tang family thing. But um, this guy named Bob Perry, uh, he's, from, he's, he's from Boston. Um, yeah, he's the one that owns, had land speed. He owns, he's got a few oh, people records, a few other things. I know who he is, yeah. Yeah, so Bob Perry, um, he had a studio in Williamsburg. And me and Large Professor was working at, working on Professor at Large. And he had the studio and he had this ill-ass engineer, uh, this dope-ass engineer. He's still alive, dope-ass engineer named Arnold. We call him the Terminator. And he was mixing and mastering and recording us. And I would see Bob and, you know, me and him would talk. And he was like, yo, man, um, I'm in conversations with RZA. We're about to start a label. I'd love to have you as, like, kind of like a marketing guy, an A&R guy. Like, the same what you do for Large Professor, but you do for RZA. And um, I was like, bet. Like, set up the meeting. And I uh, basically met with RZA, you know, told him, you know, the past Wu-Tang projects I've worked on and, you know, like, you know, I, you know, Marley Mars is one of my mentors and Lars Professor is one of my mentors. So he was like, man, like, I rocks with you. Let's, let's, ju let's just work. And uh, from there on, man, RZA just 
came into my life. So for five years, I'll just, me and Rizzo will go back and forth. We released like amazing projects, like 12 Reasons to Die with Ghostface and Adrian Young. Um, we did- Great uh, album, great album. We did uh, Adrian Young, Souls of Mischief. Um, Time, great album. Time is Now. We did um, um, Keynote Speaker with You God. We did um, Souls of Mischief. Oh, no, we did um, Soul Selection, which is RZA uh, has the rights for the stacks catalogs. So he made a Soul Selection of all the ill records. And then I met the incredible Bob James. So Bob had a bad taste of hip hop in his mouth because people sampled him but never reached out to him. So yeah had to, you know, do the legal thing and, you know, sue them, which is not wrong because it's his material. So, you know, Rizzo was like, yo, you have to be very, you have to be very gentle with Bob. I got him to this point and I'm gonna need you to massage Bob into hip hop. And I, basically the, my first conversation with Bob James was how we love him and how we cherish him and how we honor him. And he says, but why, they, why didn't they never reach out to me to me be part of the composition with them? <laughs> and I was like, yo, because I said, I said, I said, Bob, a lot of these guys don't know the business. You know, a lot of these guys, they'll get paid up front and they'll never see a back end. You know? They don't know the business. So you can't really blame, blame the artist. And um, after a while, man, me and Bob just started becoming really cool. And I started to do interviews with him on like, nah, right. Um, Fader, Fork, and, I, and um, Hip Hop DX, and, and start showing him that the hip hop community loves him. And once he starts seeing the love, and he starts seeing like people like reach out to him even more, he started like, damn, I didn't know hip hop was like this. I didn't know you guys had your own community. And um, so I, I reached out to him last year during the pandemic, and I started something called Distro Chat, where I was just talking with people from the, from the hip hop community. And uh, that, I did his first ever IG live. And then, um, you know, I, then like, you know, I reached out to him this year and I was like, yo, I want you to be a guest judge and I'm gonna have Ghostface Killer be a, a judge with you. And uh, he got real emotional during the, um, during the beat battle when, when Ghost came on because he was like, you changed my life. You don't know how you changed my life. like. Because you gave me a you gave me a new wind of making music, you know. Like we would never ever knew that. Uh, who I would never knew that twenty years from now, this this art form called hip hop will embrace me like this. I thought they would just give me the ageism, you know. Because you know Bob James is eighty two years old right now, you know. So because he's old, people think oh he's not he's not he's not he's not relevant. This this guy man. I got some records. I gave him Ghostface. Him and Ghostface got some tracks that I put together. That when they come out, it's the most craziest shit ever. And um, but yeah, man. So after that, me and Bob just became really good friends, and we're working on a project now together. And uh, I I just want to pay homage to these people, man, that people don't know about, like the Bob James in the world, you know, like the large professors of the world, you know, like guys like that, man, who 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 gave us a platform, you know, and. Um, and I think, God, you know, you know, people like El DeBarge, who I have this Sunday, you know, like so many people have sampled him from Biggie, you know, what I mean, to AZ, you know, to um, to Jizza, like so many people have sampled El DeBarge, man, and he's still alive, still kicking, still making great music. And I feel like, yo, man, I want to give these people their roses now, man. I don't want to put a picture up saying, oh, you know, oh, man. Rest in peace, just stand the third. I was like, man, let me let me pay homage to people now, man. You know, and uh, I, I had Ski Beats um, a couple months back. It's the 25th anniversary of Reasonable Doubt. You know, I'm I'm just I'm just showing love to to, to these producers, man. That that I grew up listening to, and you grew up listening to, you know. And um and and, and like I said, and the main thing is that the these producers that are, are in, they're actually learning. You know what I mean? To get tough skin. Like if you so my best example was this kid named Julian. He did um he's from California. At the time he was 16 years old. He did the Mike Dean um beat battle. Uh he got knocked out the first round, right? 
he signed up for the Mike Dean beat battle this year, right? And he washed everyone from the first round, and he won, right? So versus people being discouraged and being like, yo, F producer plug, F all this stuff, their bias is standing third. He didn't let that, he had that Kobe mentality where it was like, I'm gonna go out for that W, I'm going for the jugular. And, and that's why I designed it too. So you can build that tough kit and also you can build the network with producers that, and, and, and you know, I give a lot of my producers some producer plug packs. Like I give them like my, my personal Mike Dean kit that Mike Dean gave to me so I can make beats. And I give it to them, like, but here's these kits. Here's a kit that 45 King gave me. Here's a kit that Young Chop gave me. And, you know, it's, it's all about, you know what I mean, giving the knowledge, man. You can't just be, like, the whore of knowledge and not share it. It makes no sense. Like, that's why the Internet is so big right now, because we're sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing information, you know? Yeah, totally. And I really appreciate what you're doing there, giving, giving producers their respect to and the original composers and, that, that's that's a powerful thing, and I hope that the producer plug keeps going, man. It seems like you've gotten some good steam behind it. Yeah, we have a store that we opened in um, that we opened in um, in April. It's the producer plug store, um, nice. and it's on Canal Street, two seventy seven Canal Street, between Canal Street and Broadway in New York. And uh, we have a collaboration right now for the whole entire year with uh, Street Life Method Man and Havoc with the Yankees. So we, we have yeah, I want to talk about that real quick. Uh, your role with the Yankees, because I'm always seeing you post Yankee, Yankees theme songs and whatever. What, talk about your relationship with the New York Yankees. So um, in 2019, uh, a good friend of mine, he's one of the mod moderators on Reddit Hip Hop Heads. He was one of the guys on Reddit Hip Hop Heads. And uh, I, I started to get inside the whole Reddit, Reddit world around 2012. This is what I'm always talking about being being ahead of the curve with the technology and just just trying and testing it out, seeing these things work. And uh, and I met and I met my boy Isaac around that time. And uh, my boy 730, um, big shout out to my boy 730 and stuff. He was like, yo, um, he was like, yo, um, my one of one of my guys are in Vegas right now. Um, I know you're doing a Who show. Is it cool? You can give some tickets. I'm like, yeah, I got you. So I, I meet Isaac. Me and him hit it off. We become really cool friends. And he calls, he calls me one day. And he's like, yo, I'm in your city. I'm like, word? I'm like, all right, cool. So um, it was like, it was December, holiday season. And he's like, yo, I'm here with, with um, he's with this famous jazz musician. And they're doing all these shows. And uh, I said, yo, bro, listen, every Friday, I'm going to take you out. So I took him to, like, these cool Colombian bars and gave him a good time. So so because he had no family, and I know how it is to feel to be on tour and not have no family around you. That happened to me many of times going on tour with artists. And uh, so I just showed him a good time. And, uh, like, before he left, I gave him a link to the Squad Up video. And I was like, yo, man, this is this new video I just released last month. Check it out. Tell me if you like it. And uh, I, gave him the, I gave him the video. He loved it. And um, he said, yo, is it cool I passed the link around to my friends? So I was like, yeah, cool. No worries and stuff. So uh, he calls me like he leaves New York. He calls me like a week later. And he says, yo, I got some good news for you. I'm like, what's up? He says, uh, my boy, he works for the New York Yankees, and they want to use the song as the Yankees team song for, for 2020, to start of 2020. I was like, what? I was like, man, you go to me, man. He's like, yeah, I'm going to put you on the phone with him right now. He links me on the phone with him. He's like, hey, what's up? My name is Nick. I'm the, like, the coordinator for, for the Yankees. I, I just finished winning an a, a Emmy two years ago for doing this cuss for the Yankees. And we love the song. We, love to, we would love to start 2020 um, with, with Street Life and Method Man and make squad up the official Yankees um, team song. And I was like, is this real? Like, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this must be fake. So he's like, nah, we're sending the paperwork in a couple days. I was like, I, right. I hear this. You know, we, we in the industry, we hear these things all the time. We don't, until, until it manifests and it comes in the box, in the email box, we're not believing it. So a couple days later, 
I got the contract. I'm like, oh, shit. So I call up Street, because I'm one of them dudes, like, I don't get hyped quick. I'm not going to call Street Life and tell him, like, yo, the Yankees doing a song. I didn't hit him. I got the paperwork. I was like, yo, Street, the Yankees want to license our song and use it for their team song for 2020. So get the fuck out of here. So he get meth on the phone. I told meth, meth, like, yo, let's do it. Like, this is big. Like, the Yankees is top, top, top three, um, you know, brands of all time. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're, they're a trillion dollar brand. Like, so we, we, shot, we shot the piece um, before COVID hit. February of 2020, we shot it in, in Quad Studios and uh, Quad Studios and Premier Studios, right? And, uh, and then um, the season hit and then it was um, the pandemic, Corona. And Nick was like, yo, look, we're not gonna scrap this because we already shot it and it's a dope ass video. We're gonna release it in 2021 for you. We're gonna do the real rollout for you. We're gonna have you do opening day, all the stuff we tell you we're gonna do for, for 2020, but we're gonna do it for 2021. Just be patient with us. Cool, what I'm gonna say, no? Nah, I'd rather just take that year off, get prepared, and, um, and Yankees organization, uh, they, uh, they kept their word, man, and, and, and next, next month, we're gonna be performing in front of 50,000 people Street Life, Method Man, and Havoc. But April 1st uh, of this year, we did opening day for them. Street, Meth, Havoc. And um, man, it was, just, it was just to be in the, those big ass luxury suites with all the food, all the bells and whistles. And, and every home game, they play that video. Squad up video, Street Life and Method Man. Every home game. And, um, and, and, and if you go on Twitter and you hashtag squad up, the Yankees logo come out. So they did so much amazing things for us. So like I said, man, thank you to, for the Yankees, man. Thank you to Nick, Pete, um, you know what I mean? Mr. Steinbrenner, all of them, man. Thank you, man. They just opened us, opened us up and all. And, and look how far hip hop has came, man. Like we have come from the streets to being in the Yan Yankee Stadium, being a, the, the theme song for the Yankees. Like, you know what I mean? So anything is possible. You just gotta have a positive mindset, and and you gotta go. Through, you gotta go through the trials sometimes, man. You gotta go through the up and ups and downs. So when you get to these things, you're like, damn, it was worth it. It was worth it. Um, going through this, but yeah, man, it, it's it's a beautiful thing, man. It's a beautiful thing. I, like I said, man, I'm, I'm I'm super super excited for next month. And um, I'm excited, um, and I'm definitely knowing we're going to the World Series. They've been doing extremely well, um, the Yanks. And um, yeah, man, I'm just showing them a, a lot of love, you know. And and, and and as you see, every time I post it, they have the squad, they have a squad up um, little logo for us. So every time they win a game, it says squad up. So it's like it's like yo, it's free marketing, man. <laughs> for a whole year from the biggest organization in the world, you know. So yeah. it's a beautiful thing, you know. That's good. I mean, we're, I'm from New England and Boston, so you know, yeah, we we're oh. a little, we're a little we're a little bit of a rival here with the Yankees, but you know, <laughs> you can't deny how good they are. <laughs> yeah, you guys are dope. You got listen, man. You guys, what is it? Big Poppy is Big Poppy still there? No, no, no. Who's there? I'm not. To be honest, I'm not the biggest sports guy. I won't be able to uh, tell you all the ins and outs of it. <laughs> the Red Sox is a mean team, though. The Red Sox is a mean team. I I ain't in front on Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put yeah. We're diehards. I ain't in front. Yeah, yeah. I mean team, but I, this year, man, I already know we're going to World Series. I know we're going. We're gonna win it. We're going all the Wouldn't way. Surprise me. Wouldn't surprise we're going me. All the way this year. We'll, you can see Street Life and Method Man and Havoc performing the World Series this year. It's gonna. It's That's gonna, great. It's gonna be big. It's gonna be big. You know. So so, so one other thing I want to. One other thing to about the Street Life. His album's coming out this year. Story of my life. You know what I'm saying? Featuring Method Man, the album's fire. It's already done. You know what I mean? So I'm mean, I'm excited. I'm excited about everything. Word. So one other thing I want to talk to you about is I go on your Instagram page and uh, <laughs> I see you post a lot of interesting things. Um, the the favorite, my favorite one was, you know, I'm not. They're not. They're not conspiracy theories. You're just stupid. <laughs> it's one of the, one of the things I say. 
you know, talk to me. You know, I, I know you're an you're 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 one of the, one of your big theories is is uh, you're anti-vaccine, correct? Anti-mask, anti-vaccine. No, no, I wear I wear respectfully. I wear a mask. Like but you're it, anti-vaccine though. I I'm not rocking with that right. So let's talk about why. I, I, like, I like your perspective on why no vaccines. All yeah. right. The reason why I'm not, like, first and foremost, not messing with it. I got COVID in 2019 before it was even big, before people even. So you were ahead of, you were ahead of technology. You were ahead of COVID. <laughs> I got COVID in 2019 in December, right? Um, I didn't even know I had it. I, didn't, I thought I just had the bad, a real bad form of flu, right? Um, around February, uh, my friend, he's a nurse, he works for Mount Sinai, he calls me and he's like, yo, man, true question, did you get sick in December? I was like, yo, man, I had the worst. And he's like, bro, you have COVID. L, all the symptoms, right? Um, I didn't die. Was I sick? Yeah. Did it take me like a week and some change to get back to normal? Yeah, you know? Um, but I didn't die. I, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't do nothing. Not, nothing happened to me. Um, to, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fairly healthy guy. And I feel, the reason why I feel like I did get COVID is because two days before that, I went to go see 45 King and he had these um, ice cream sandwiches. And I'm vegetarian. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm plant-based. And uh, I had, I had this, I had two of them. And then I went to go DJ on a Monday. And then I got sick the next day. And when I woke up, woke up, I was super sick. So I think the milk that like was in my body and it, it did come in, it, it, went, it went straight to me, right? So I just started taking care of myself even more, like with the green juices, with um, going, to the, going to like a sauna. I, I just do a lot of things to keep my body. I exercise, I eat right, I run. I do a lot of things to keep my body and keep my immune system correct. Um, and during that time as well, I was doing a lot of um, food distribution for a lot of people. So I would, you know, help people that didn't have, that lost their jobs. So um, I never ever had no issue with, 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 the, um, well, with uh, my immune system. But to like say like, yo, I'm gonna get a, 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 a vaccine that's not even, you know, has clinical trials and and that takes five to 10 years to get right, you know? And um, I'm not knocking no one that did get it, you know, to each his own. I'm just not gonna do it myself because I don't know what's the side effects of any of that yet, you know? I know a lot of people who did get the vaccine, you know what I mean, that passed away, you know what I mean? Respect to their family, you know what I mean, everyone else. And I know people who got the vaccine that got really sick, you know, but they got better, you know? but. It, it just didn't make no sense to me that you get a vaccine, but you can still get COVID, you know? That's like my, 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 my aunt, she had polio, right? And she had a polio shot. And when she got a polio shot, means that she won't get polio again, right? When you go get the, chick, the, the chicken pox, you know, you get the chicken pox once, but you don't get the chicken pox again, you know? So it didn't make no sense to me for me to get a, a vaccine that's not tested, that they're like, you know, doing all this craziness about, and and it's not 100% like, where well, you're gonna be good. So I, I, logically, it doesn't make sense for me. You know what I mean? Second, a lot of the stuff that's in inside the vaccine, you know what I mean? There's like dead embryos and a bunch of other stuff. You know what I mean? I, Cause I'm, I'm Muslim and I don't wanna put some foreign, some foreign agents in my body that I don't know about. and. Like I said, you have an immune system, right? And your immune system has to work for you. And you have to eat certain supplements and certain vitamins to get your immune system right. So like right now, like I, I'm like right now, I'm in vacation, right? But this is this is spa thing they have over here, right? Where you stay in hot water for two minutes and then you walk over and you stay in ice cold bucket freezing water, right? And then you go back into the hot water. What that's supposed to do is shock your immune system to wake back up, right? I just took a COVID test yesterday. I have no COVID. 
You know what I mean? Because, you know, to go back in the States, to go back to New York, that's no good. So I'm good. Like, I take care of myself. Now, people that have the need, that need to take the vaccine because of their job, I can't knock that. That's what you have to do. But for me personally, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'll wait. I'll wait. It's, it's a waiting game. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people, like, look at the people who took the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Like, oh, what, 800 people died? Blood clots? You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of complications right now, you know, and um, and I don't and I don't feel like being a test to no one at this point. You know what I mean? I I, I told everyone I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm just <laughs> let me see the science. Let this let's see what happens. You know, like like I said, you know, I, I have knowledge itself. You know what I'm saying? The t- t- Tuskegee experiments. You know, like oh, we're gonna do these things to you, and then these people end up dying. You know. So I was like, I'm not really that fond of the American government. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're you know what I'm saying? They're, they're doing a lot of funny style ass things to to people of color, man. And, and you know, this is the first time, I mean, you're like, like, come on, this is the first time ever we had no flu season. This is the first, like, like this is the first, I mean, these guys can find a vaccine, but they can't find like the cure for cancer. We couldn't find the cure of AIDS, but they, they, they have, they found a vaccine in less than, than, less than like what, a year? And then, and then, then it's like you know, when you when you, get, when you read this Freedom of Information Act that comes out as well, you know, um, about Dr. Fauci and him knowing about the Wuhan lab and all this. I've been saying this shit was real. Motherfuckers, oh, you lying, you conspiracy theorist. You know, what conspiracy means you know people that go to jail for conspiracy of selling drugs is that they motherfuckers know they were doing this shit. But you have to look into the black and white. You know what I'm saying? And I'm I'm just one of these people that just not gonna fall for the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? I'm not anti I'm I'm, I'm not anti mask because I know certain people, you know, you know, they do get sick and people do die from that shit. You know what I'm saying? Um I'm not gonna you know what I mean? So out of respect for certain people, if I have to go into a building, if someone is like, yo, I'm sick or whatever, I put the mask on out of respect, but the, the, the shot, I don't know yet. I don't know. Fair enough. I don't know yet. The other question I have for you is your glasses. Those are, what, those like custom made. I mean, I've never yeah, seen said, glasses like that. Do you, do you have really bad vision or is this just so, a fashion statement? So, um, there's a, I got, I got the back of my, the back of my corneas are scratched out. Right. And, you know how people have regular eyeballs, like it's like a circle, regular eyeballs. My eyeball is stretched. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, so because my eyeball is stretched, it's like it's not just a circle. It's like it's like it fits. Like it's kind of weird. But then then my corneas are scratched out. So I have this. So I so if I take my glasses off, I can't see detail. I can see you, but I can't actually see the detail of, of who it is. I just see a blur. And I was and I was born with this since I was a little kid. This is nothing like, you know, so nothing happened. happened. It was just like Every, a disease or something. It's something that I had since I was I was I was literally born with this. I was born like when I came. Is there out, a name for it? Um, it's like myopia, something like that. But the, 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 my corneas are scratched out, basically. You know what I mean? So I can't really see see I can't really see things like that. You know what I mean? So when I was born, literally when I came out, my mom's belly and all that stuff. I couldn't even see them clearly. My parents didn't know until I was like two, three years old that I had a vision issue, because my my, my parents like they would uh they would do groceries and then I would just run to the door and snack into the door. They didn't see the, the doors open, and then my mom took me to a, a, a eye specialist in the city, and uh, they found out they found out like yo your son has this issue with his eyes. And then, um, and I had like a, my eye, I had like a turning eye as well. The left, my left eye was like turned in, so they had to bring it back out. I do vision therapy, a whole bunch of stuff. But um, but yeah, yeah, that's 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 you know with my glasses. That's the that's what it is. I just have like bad. It's not bad vision. It's just it's just my cornea is fucked up. I just never seen the layout like that. I mean, I've seen people with all type of vision, but I've never seen like the glass inside the glass like you have. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> special. My whole, my, my whole, my whole, my whole life has been these type of, 
This is thin. This is not even the thick. These, I used to wear like these bottle cap glasses, and it was it was bad. It was. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm and glad and I'm glad. I asked my doctor, yo, like, yo, will there ever be a therapy or anything or a surgery? He says, no, this is forever. They can never. It's like only person that could ever change that for you is God. Yeah. Feel that. Your boy Jimmy Age just uh, said glasses are like your, his signature now. So I guess it, it's actually working for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, word, man. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. But, hey, uh, really appreciate you coming through, Gustavo, man. I look forward to doing more business. I look forward to seeing Always. what you keep doing. And, now, and it, it's been great we're talking to you. We're going to do that tour. And, and, and you know, we're going to holler at you, me and Street. We're going to holler at you so we can, get, we can get that date up there, too. You know what word, I'm saying? That's what's up. Great. And get it going. You you got something with Red and Meth coming up soon, right? Yeah, I'm helping out promote it. Uh, what's the Palladium book that I'm just helping promote it? But yeah, I hope maybe you can come through then. You know? Yeah, I'm gonna come through. I'm I'm gonna be there regardless. So we go cool. we'll, we'll chill, smoke something, get right. All right. Well, All thanks, right. brother. And I, I want to thank everybody for tuning into the Leeds Edutainment podcast with Gustavo Guerra of Distro uh, Producer Plug, and uh, we'll talk soon, bro. Peace, bro. Talk to you soon. <laughs>